Hello. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to us today. And hopefully everyone is healthy and staying safe. I am Var Barbosa, Developer Advocate at IBM's Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. And presenting with me today is Yi Hong Wang, Software Engineer for the IBM Cognitive Open Technologies Group. Today we'll be discussing machine learning on edge devices, and more specifically, how can you integrate Node-RED and TensorFlow.js to make it easier to incorporate some machine learning into your IoT device. Now, it's no big secret that edge computing is on the rise and the Internet of Things is a hot topic. The growth of connected devices is staggering. You have home automation systems, smart cars and appliances, mobile phones, and even personal drones. Data from IoT analytics show that there are about 7 billion IoT devices worldwide, and it is predicted by the end of 2020, there will be more than uh, IoT devices than laptops, desktops, and phones. And by 2025, uh, Gartner projects the number of IoT connected devices will surpass 21 billion. Considering the sheer number and variety of these devices and sensors, getting started with IoT can pose many challenges. First, each device has its own set of requirements and restrictions around its interface, protocol, and so on. Also, trying to set up these devices to communicate with each other, or even just trying to get messages off of one of these devices, can prove to be time consuming and often times are non-trivial. So solutions require pulling together different devices, APIs, services, and sometimes protocols, and then trying to get them to interact and work together. S tools are needed that make all this easier and allow you to bring all these various pieces of hardware and software together in a manner that is approachable. Enter Node-RED. Node-RED is a flow-based programming tool for wiring together hardware devices, APIs, and online services in new and interesting ways. It is a visual programming tool with a browser-based editor that makes it easy to wire together an IoT flow and deploy it to your device with just a single click. Node-RED runtime is lightweight and built on top of Node.js taking full advantage of the event-driven non-blocking model. Node-RED makes it easier for more people to get started quickly without having to immediately dig into code. So rather than having to write tons of code, you instead just drag and drop nodes into a workspace and connect them to each other to build your solution. Because of this low code approach, it has become an ideal tool for low-cost hardware such as Raspberry Pi, but you can also run it from the cloud or locally on your laptop or desktop. Through its drag-and-drop user interface, you can develop and deploy powerful applications with minimal coding. So let's have a look. This is the Node-RED editor, and as you can see, we access it with the browser, and you can access it through the browser after you've installed Node-RED. On the left-hand side, you'll notice is the palette area, which consists of a large set of pre-installed nodes. And you have nodes for all sorts of functionality, services, devices. Now, along with the set of pre-installed nodes that comes with Node-RED, you can easily add more nodes. And you can find nodes out in the Node-RED library. So, for example, you can just search for a particular area or a particular service, and you can find nodes related to that. In, so you can find nodes in the Node-RED library. You can also find nodes on GitHub as well as NPM. But along with these nodes that you can find out there in the community, you can also create your own custom node and install it for you to use in your flow. And on the right side, you'll see we have the tools sidebar. And the tools sidebar just provides a number of resources to assist you in working with your flow. You have the info section which you can find information and like help and documentation for a particular node. You also have the debug, and that's where you'd have your debug messaging and your logging when you're running and testing your flows. 
and there are other stuff in the right sidebar along with a dashboard and configuration information as well. And in the middle area, it, that's where you would be your workspace. And that's where you would go about wiring together your flows. Now, to create a flow, it's as straightforward as just finding a node, dragging it into the flow area, into the workspace area, excuse me. And then you can go ahead and uh, add multiple nodes, and then you would just go ahead and uh, connect the nodes, and there we go. We'd have a very simple uh, node red flow. And now, if we go to the information, you can see if I click on one of these nodes, it gives me the help information about that particular node. So now that I have this node, I can go ahead and deploy it. And since I have it installed locally, it's just being deployed locally. But if, for example, if I had it installed on a device, it would be deploying it to that device. And if I just trigger this node, we can see this was this uh, this inject just it sent a timestamp to the debug node, and the debug node just logged that information. So that's the typically uh, how you'd go about wiring your flow and testing it. But let's go ahead and make something a little bit more interesting. So let me go ahead and find the HTTP uh, request node. Let me put that there. And then I'm going to wire up this to the HTTP request and then the HTTP request uh, to the debug and when I double click on one of these nodes it brings up the edit panel and this edit panel is where you can configure the particular node if the node accepts any configuration so I'm gonna change this from timestamp to numbers so I'm gonna come up with a number so let's say 19 so what's gonna happen when I click on this it's gonna inject the number 19 but let's go to the HTTP request node and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it to an endpoint that I want the request node to hit. So in this case, I'm just going to use the numbers API endpoint, which is a REST endpoint that you can send it a number, and then it'll give you a random fact about that number. So I got that. So I have my flow all set. So I can go ahead and deploy it. And now that it's successfully deployed, I'll go ahead and run it, and we can see what it does. And you see, uh, it sent the number 19, and we get 19 is the number of years and 235 luminations. And let's try it one more time, see if it gives us something different. Oh, uh, no, I guess there's not much for, oh, there we go. 19 is the f final year of a person is a teenager. So this is uh, basically what it is for uh, for the idea of around a flow and creating your flow in Node Red. And what you can also do with these flows is you can actually export them as a JSON file. And it's as you can see here, the flow is just uh, a JSON file and so you can easily share the flows with others as well so that's all good and great but what if you want to incorporate machine learning into your flow so that you can just as easily as I did here drag and drop nodes you can drag and drop a machine learning node to perform some AI task for you and that is where tensorflow.js comes in tensorflow.js is an open source JavaScript library to build, train, and run machine learning models in JavaScript environments, such as the browser and Node.js. It's TensorFlow rewritten uh, for the JavaScript ecosystem. And it includes a low-level API that allows for linear algebra and complex matrix math to be done all in JavaScript. But it also includes a high-level API that closely follows the Keras API for constructing machine learning models. And let's go ahead and take a look at a TensorFlow.js example. The best place to start with TensorFlow.js is actually their website. And in their website, you'll find demos as well as tutorials and also their API documentation. And they do have very good API documentation. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Now, quickly looking through this, you can see there are a lot of functions available to you. So you have some tensor creation and transformation functions. You also have model functions for working with models. And you have the layers functions for defining the layers of your model. And there are also operations uh, for doing the linear algebra and matrix math operation work. So, and there's also much, much more. 
So now since we're talking about JavaScript and JavaScript runs on the browser, you can easily run and try a lot of these uh, functionality right here in the docs. So for example, I can just go ahead and run this and this right here just defined a tensor and then printed it out. Now, once you import TensorFlow.js, you actually have this TF variable, which you can use for all your calls. So let me go ahead and edit this and try something a little different. So all I'm doing here is defining a two-dimensional tensor with these values in it. And then I'm going to take that tensor, get the log of it, then square that, and then print out the value. So I'll go ahead and run this. And then we get the results of that. So in addition to all these API functions that you see here, there are additional functions that are specific to the environment that you're running in. So for example, we have the Node.js API, which has some additional uh, functions for Node.js. And then you have the React Native API for when working in React Native. And you have a TFJS Viz, which is for visualizing what the model is doing. So creating bar charts and uh, heat maps and things of that nature. So now let's go ahead and take a look at a more in-depth example. And here we have an example code showing running inferencing with TensorFlow.js. So as you can see, the first thing we do is just go ahead and load the model. And in this case, we're loading the model from a URL on TensorFlow Hub. And with the model loaded, you would pre-process the input. And in this case, the input is going to be an image. So we're going to take that image and convert it to a tensor. And once we have the input tensor, we can go ahead and run the model. And once we have the output uh, from the model, we would go ahead and pre-process it. So and and turn it into something that's a little bit more human readable or consumable uh, later on, uh, further on down the flow. So the whole entire flow would basically be load the model, pre-process the input, run the model, and then take the prediction and process the output. So that's the basic flow for running inferencing with TensorFlow. Now, what if you wanted to create your model? So this example here shows how you could go about building a model with TensorFlow.js. So in this case, we're building a sequential model. And we're taking the sequential model, and we're adding a number of layers to it. So the, uh, we add a couple of convolutional layers, a couple max pooling layers, where we uh, specify the activation and other uh, properties that the layer uh, takes. And then after that, we go ahead and flatten it. And then finally, we provide a, a dense layer with a soft max activation. And once we have all the layers in place, we can go ahead and uh, compile the model with the appropriate optimizer and loss function. So since both Node-RED and TensorFlow.js run in Node.js, combining the two is inevitable. So the goal is to get to a point where you can just launch Node-RED, import a TensorFlow.js model node, and then drag the node into your flow and wire it to your device. Much like you saw me do earlier in the, in the, with the default Node-RED nodes, you should be able to do the same thing with custom TensorFlow.js models in Node-RED. But why combine Node-RED and TensorFlow.js? As you saw, Node-RED makes it simple to wire together devices, as well as APIs, and TensorFlow.js makes it possible to build and deploy machine learning models in JavaScript. So the two together make it easier for developers and IoT enthusiasts to incorporate machine learning into their device. If you bring TensorFlow.js models into the Node-RED platform, there is a lower barrier to entry into machine learning that the visual programming environment of Node-RED helps facilitate. Uh, you also get an increase in privacy and data security that comes with being able to perform predictions directly on the device collecting the data and not have to try to send the data across the network or have the data leave the device. And keeping, uh, keeping it all on the device makes it possible to perform inferencing in remote locations or in areas with unreliable or no network connectivity. But to get to that point, uh, first we need to have these custom nodes. Luckily, there are already a number of TensorFlow.js nodes that you can find in the Node-RED community library as well as in GitHub. These custom nodes help you quickly get started with adding machine learning tasks 
into your IoT flow. You can find some general nodes for loading and running TensorFlow.js nodes and models, as well as nodes for specific use case models like the BERT tokenizer or object detection. But what about uh, when you can't find an existing TensorFlow.js node for your use case? Well, for these scenarios, Node-RED is highly extensible and you can create your own custom node. The first thing to understand about creating Node-RED modules is what are the pieces that make up a Node-RED node. A Node-RED node consists of three main files. You have your JavaScript file that defines the no what the node does. You have the HTML file that de defines the node's properties, the edit dialog, as well as the help text, text for the node. And then you have the package.json file, which is used to package it all together as an NPM module. And let's go ahead and quickly look at an example custom Node-RED node. So we'll first look at the package.json, which is similar to the package.json of any NPM module, uh, with the slight difference of having the Node-RED section. And this section right here is just defining the Node-RED nodes that are going to be available in this package. Next, if we look at the HTML file, this is made up of three script tags. And the first one defines the edit dialog. So this is what's going to show up when the user double clicks on the node and they get presented with an edit dialog where they can go ahead and edit any of the configurations that the node may accept. And then we have the JavaScript tag section. And what this does is it basically registers the node with Node-RED. And it's also where you can set your default parameters for any of the node's settings. And lastly, we have the script tag for the help section or the help info. So this is when the user clicks on a node and they go to the info uh, sidebar. This is the information that will be presented to them. And lastly, we have the JavaScript, which is actually going to define the behavior of the node. So the JavaScript file is just going to export a single function. And this function is going to have to go ahead and register for an on input event. And what that is, it's going to get alerted whenever a message comes into the node's input. And once that message comes in, it can go ahead and take appropriate action. So if we see here in this example, when the message comes in, we're going to go ahead and pre-process the input. Then we're going to take that pre-process input tensor and go ahead and run a prediction on it against the model. And then once we have the prediction, we're going to process the output. And this is the similar flow that you saw in the basic TensorFlow.js example. So an input comes in, we pre-process it, we run inferencing, and then we go ahead and process the output and we, to get the output in a nice f JSON format. And then we can go ahead and send it out the node to the next node in the flow. And then we have the same stuff we had before, which is, for example, loading the model in here. So this is the basic uh, uh, building blocks of a particular Node-RED node. So with this, we can now go ahead and see this node in action. So here we have a Node-RED flow using that custom TensorFlow.js node we just went over. And the way this flow is going to work is once I trigger this inject node, this image will be sent over to the custom node. The node will pre-process the image and turn it into a tensor, run inference on that tensor, process the prediction, and then send it out to the debug node. I also have here an image preview node, and it is just so that we can see what image is being sent to the custom node. Let's go ahead and deploy this flow. It is not successfully deployed, and we can go ahead and run it. When we run it, we get a preview of the image that was used. And looking at the debug, uh, we can examine the prediction that was returned. You'll notice it is an array with objects corresponding to the what was detected in the image. And in this case, we have three objects, each one being a person. And we get, along with that, we get the accuracy score, as well as the bounding box. Uh, which outlines where in the image the specific object was detected. And just like that, we have a custom TensorFlow.js node that allows us to add machine learning capabilities to our IoT devices. That is great, 
we can now create Node-RED nodes with TensorFlow.js that anyone can just add into their flow and effortlessly deploy to their device. As straightforward as this may appear, there can still be challenges and things to keep in mind if you are to bring TensorFlow.js models to Node-RED. For starters, we need to think about the model, such as storing a model. Should it be packaged with Node.js module, or do you prefer uh, to serve it from an external URL or CDN? How well would the model perform on edge devices? Not all models are optimized or can easily be optimized for running on low compute devices. Uh, model optimization can be a whole talk in itself. You also have to think about how best to run the model. Should it be kept in a main thread or moved to a worker thread? How should loading, caching be handled? Where in the lifecycle is it best to load the model? Should it be added into the global context, the flow context, or just left it within the node context? And as far as data goes, you can have at your disposal audio inputs, video inputs, and all kinds of sensor input data. How much of the model input output should be processed by the Node-RED node versus letting the user of your node handle that themselves in their flow? A lot of these questions will be answered by the model you're working with and the use case you're trying to solve. And with that, I'll pass it on to Yihong to take you through additional example flows and to talk more in detail uh, to an interesting solution he was recently playing around with. Thanks, Mark. Hey, everyone. My name is Yihong Wang, and I'm with the company for Open Pack Group at IBM. Um, so now that you know a thing or two about uh, no rate and TensorFlow HR and the way we combine them together, um, that's uh, look into some uh, simple flow to help showcase the technology in action and hopefully inspire some of your own ideas. So Va just showed a uh, basic object detection flow um, with the simple tutorial node, uh, which would uh, look something like this. The flow is very simple. Um, there's a, a camera uh, as the input node, and here is the um, uh, custom tutorial node, and then we will do the uh, object detection inside here. Um, the major logic um, is inside um, the tutorial node. Um, we use a DFJS models NPM package, um, which has a nice API and hide all the pre and post processing. In many cases, um, this is good. Um, using the prepackaged model API is easy and uh, works for many cases. However, um, you are limited uh, to just the cases and the models that are used by the package. Here is another example. Um, in this flow, I use some TensorFlow.js custom node uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, where you extract uh, the functionalities of the tutorial node um, into several uh, individual nodes um, here, here, and here. So the flow itself is very simple. You just take the input from the camera and do some pre-processing and then pass the data uh, into a model node and run the model inference and then um, we uh, pass to a post-processing node uh, and to uh, do some post-processing against the output of the model node. And finally, um, we pass the data to a bounding box node, and then we will draw the uh, bounding box as well as the label uh, onto the images. So without further ado, uh, let's try it out. So you actually detect um, one person and a cell phone. So let's go into um, the detail of the flow. For the the, the second node here uh, is actually um, a key of a function node. Um, it's doing the uh, preprocessing logic. And the logic here is very simple. Um, it's just called uh, TensorFlow.js API uh, to decode the image and then um, convert the data are into TF objects. 
So inside the TF function node, you can access all the TensorFlow.js API under the TF variable. And at the end of the code, it tries to uh, compose an um, main object and containing um, the uh, image tensors. That's the format that uh, model node need. And here is actually uh, the model node. So it's a TF model node. Uh, in the TF model node, you need to surprise by um, your model URL. So it's an uh, object detection uh, pre model. Um, you, um, when you start a flow, um, you will try to um, uh, retrieve the model um, from this URL. So you can assign it to point to a remote um, URL. You can also point to your local file system. Uh, if it's a remote URL, um, you will try to retrieve the model, um, store it into uh, the local file system, and cache it. You will also maintain the cache. And when you uh, you kick off the flow, um, and the data um, flow through this node, you will um, run the model inference, and then um, you will pass the, uh, the the model inference result uh, to the next node. So the next node is actually uh, post processing, because the uh, the result of the uh, model inference, the object detection model, is actually an um, Either an uh, tensor um, or an array of tensor. So um, we we need the post processing node um, to convert it uh, to a more uh, friendly uh, format, as you can see here. After uh, the post processing, um, the data will become um, an array of objects, and these objects actually are the uh, the objects that it detect uh, in the images. So the information containing um, the class name, um, also uh, the coordinates of the detected uh, the objects. So um, then uh, in the flow, we try to combine um, the result uh, from the post-processing, as well as the result uh, from the original uh, camera. And then we um, Combine these two data, um, and then, then send it to the uh, bounding box uh, node. In the bounding box node, you don't need to uh, provide any uh, configurations, so you will automatically uh, using the information you pass in, um, uh, including the image as well as the uh, bounding box information, and then draw uh, these um, information uh, onto. Uh, the pictures, as you can see here. So um, you can see the node here and here. Um, those are the uh, TensorFlow custom node. So uh, the only thing you need to provide to them is actually um, here is the model URL and also the class uh, definition and JSON file, and that's it. And I think the only code um, I have, I programmed, is only the preprocessing. But even here, it, the logic is very simple. So you can see, uh, by leveraging those um, custom nodes, you can uh, compose your uh, model inference flow uh, very easily. Um, so in this case, um, we use the object detection. So if you, for example, if you um, train another object detection and with the, uh, your own um, classes, the only thing you need to change is uh, modify this URL and to point to uh, your model. And also in the post processing node, you change the classes class URL to point to uh, your uh, class uh, definition file. Then you can. Um, around the flow. So it's very easy. There is quite a bit uh, you can do with object detection. Uh, as for the no ray part, I also found something quite interesting. Uh, because no ray is running on Node.js, and the benefit of using Node.js is you can run it on many type of environments uh, from your laptop 
uh, to the cloud platform. So uh, let's try run something um, at the edge device. Uh, the low cost hardware, um, such as Raspberry Pi or JSON Nano. Um, luckily, uh, I do have uh, JSON Nano by hand, and in the next flow, uh, I'd like to show you an uh, auto garage door flow. In this flow, uh, I use several devices. Our uh, first one uh, is this JSON Nano. Um, it's a small and inexpensive uh, single board computer, and it also has GPU on it. Um, running uh, model inference uh, is quite smooth on it. Um, you can see I also uh, attach um, a Wi-Fi USB adapter to it. Um, it allows uh, me to uh, control my IP camera here, and so I can um, take a, a snapshot uh, from this IP camera and retrieve the image. Then lastly, uh, I use a garage door opener hub uh, to control my garage door opener. Um, so it's also uh, very cheap. Let's look at the flow on my desktop first. Uh, later on, I will deploy this flow um, on to the uh, JSON Nano. But before we look at the flow, let's um, look at the model that I'm going to use. I found the uh, uh, auto license plate recognition model uh, from this repository. And he already provides a pre-trained model. And the accuracy is pretty good. So I directly uh, convert this pre-trained model into uh, TensorFlow.js web friendly format. And it provides uh, two approach to use uh, this model. The first approach is that you send the image uh, into the model and you will uh, recognize the license plate as well as the numbers and characters on it. But um, when I run in this uh, approach uh, on my JSON, you know, it took me about uh, 50 seconds. So I think it's too long. So I use the second approach. In the second approach, it actually has two steps. Uh, the first step is uh, you, the same. You send the image into the model, um, but you will only return you uh, the license plate uh, you found in the images. So you use that information uh, to do the uh, image cropping and cropping out the license plate. So then you send the image only uh, the license plate uh, into uh, the model again. So you will return you the uh, numbers and characters uh, on the license plate. And uh, by using the second uh, approach, it took me uh, about five seconds on the JSON Nano. So I think uh, it's pretty good. So let's look at uh, the detail of flow uh, here. The first thing is that I try to trigger um, the shutter on the camera. So I took it. A picture um, from that camera and the second step is I try to retrieve it back because it's an IP camera so the, the thing I did is that I used the API call um, to do those stuff and then uh, after I retrieve the image back I do um, the same the image processing and then I send it to uh, the auto license play uh, with the engine model in here, you see that I store the, the model uh, in my uh, local file system. And then, like I mentioned earlier, it will retrieve the license plate um, with the uh, its coordinates if we find any uh, license plate inside the image. Then I do the uh, cropping, so then I do, uh, then I need to do the preprocessing against the license plate image again. Then send into the model so the second time, and the second time you uh, return me back those um, the character uh, it detects um, license plate. And in, in here, I try to output in to the debug message. So you can see I also attach uh, a camera input node here uh, because I want to try it uh, on my desktop first and make sure. Everything works smoothly, and then I can deploy it onto um, the JSON node. And on the JSON node, of course, I will uh, go with uh, this flow here. 
let's try this flow on my desktop first. Um, you can see uh, I'm holding a license plate, and let me trigger the flow uh, by using the um, front facing camera on my uh, desktop. So you can see it's actually uh, successfully uh, detect all the uh, character and numbers on my license plate. But you notice it is not, um, it's quite slow. Um, actually, the reason is that I, I display the image. So uh, you send the image back and forth uh, uh, from uh, the device. So, so when you deploy the flow on uh, um, the device, and you need to disable the uh, image viewer and you can improve the performance. So let's look at the flow on the JSON node. Um, uh, the last node uh, on the flow uh, on JSON node is a little bit different. Um, I switch this node from uh, debug uh, to uh, garage opener uh, node. In this node, I try to uh, call the garage door opener hub. Uh, to open the garage door if the license plate detect on the image uh, match to uh, my license plate. And this is my uh, uh, IP camera that I attach um, onto, on the top of my garage door outside. And this is the uh, garage door opener hub. You can, um, I can send the a signal to uh, this hub, then he will send uh, the open or close a signal to the garage door opener. So I have a video uh, yesterday, then I, it will show you how this flow works. As you can see, I'm pretty satisfied with the result I got. Uh, making those type of object detection flow is very easy and quick. However, uh, you are not limited to just image-based apps, as you can load and run any TensorFlow JS model. Um, um, no way. We even uh, have a flow uh, for using a bird model uh, for cinnamon analysis on uh, things like uh, YouTube comments and tweets. So many things you can do. To recap, with the vast amount of sensor data provided by a variety of IoT devices, uh, in innovating on this uh, data and creating applications from them is where those no way and principal change can shine. Uh, as you saw, um, no way uh, provide a platform uh, that is super flexible and extensible. Uh, if some functionalities that you want doesn't exist yet, you can uh, easily create a no-way node, uh, potentially uh, use some of the hundreds of thousands of the MVM package out there. Uh, there are also a lot of TensorFlow uh, models that you can use. TensorFlow.js uh, even uh, has several model APIs already packaged as MVM modules, uh, like the uh, object detection model that I showed earlier. Um, the fact that uh, these two technologies both live in the Node.js ecosystem makes integration uh, relatively uh, seamless. Uh, with TensorFlow.js, um, since model inference uh, is done locally, uh, data privacy uh, shouldn't uh, be a concern. And also, uh, you don't have to rely on uh, internet connectivity for your model to work. Node and um, TensorFlow.js uh, can be uh, used rapidly to uh, view AI-enabled IoT applications. The speed of realizing uh, this class of applications is a strength of these technologies. AI uh, is democratized and made even more accessible. And uh, with that, uh, we provide uh, some link uh, to where you can learn more. And uh, that concludes this session. 
Uh, thank you so much. Hey, hello. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the talk. And any questions, feel free to re reach out to Yi Hong or myself or ask in the chat. And early in the chat, a couple of people were uh, asking about accessing the video and the slides. So the Open Source Summit team will be making all the content available. But in addition, you can actually find our video and the slide if you go to ibm.biz slash tfjs dash nodred dash OSS 2020. So now let's see if we have any questions. All right, I don't see any questions at the moment. So we'll just give people a moment to see if they have any questions to ask. Yeah. Actually, Hong, I have a question for you. Uh, how long would you sure. say it took you to get that flow together and get it working with your garage door opener? Um, I guess is it took me uh, about. Uh, I, I will say, uh, do, do uh, if including the the device setup, I need to <laughs> mount the IV camera on top of the garage door. If including those stuff, I think it would took me about. Um, um, two hours, yeah. The yeah. the tricky part is that you need to find an angle, that the angle can uh, can get your license plate, and also um, uh, the benefit of using that uh, IP camera is that it's wide angle, so uh, I need to face the camera down a little bit and uh, focus on the, the the front end of the vehicle only. I need to. I don't have to shoot the whole the vehicle they coming up to my driveway. Yeah. And code mm -hmm. uh, ab about the coding part is, uh, I think it took me about uh, maybe less than one hour to to do the coding because um, those no uh, pre existing um, TensorFlow.js custom packages. So those no are easy. Uh, but uh, I need to write some programming to, for example, to um, copying the image um, with the license plate. That's the first part. And the second part is I need to, once I get the, uh, the output from the, uh, the model, um, tell me the license plate uh, character and digit, I need to do a comparison. That's, that's the part mm -hmm. I need to configure. Right now, I, I hard code my license plate <laughs> on that uh, flow, mm -hmm. so it can only recognize uh, my vehicle only. And the, okay, so Sheldon, someone has a question and they said the camera node was already available, correct? So that was just the, the default camera node available in the node, the node red library, correct? So it was in a special camera node that you used. Um, if, uh, let me answer that question properly. Um, if um, he, he are talking about the uh, camera node, uh, that camera node on the node red node is actually um, using the built-in camera on your desktop. It's not using that uh, IP camera um, uh, API. So that, that camera node is actually linked to uh, your built-in uh, browser built-in camera. It's your uh, front-facing uh, cam camera. So mm -hmm. um, the way I control the camera is through the API call because that, that camera is an IP camera. So I call the uh, a remote API call to get to um, have a Photoshop and then retrieve the image back. But I believe now today um, those IP camera uh, actually provide a lot of features. For example, they have motion sensor, so you can have reduce some sort of uh, webhook. So uh, when he detect the motion sensor, he will notify you. So in in that sense, then 
uh, if it, it detect the motion sensor, uh, the motion sensor detect motion, then it can uh, trigger your flow to start your flow. Um, when you see uh, the demo in my video, actually, uh, I manually trigger that flow because uh, I don't have the motion sensor for my IP camera yet. But I believe um, uh, those IP uh, camera with the sensor is very uh, uh, common right now. So, yeah. Thanks. So, any other question? Is there any AI library can be used with no way? Um, I think uh, for our talk uh, that, that we try to focus, uh, integrate the TensorFlow.js. So TensorFlow.js itself is actually an AI uh, library, machine learning library. So like uh, Va mentioned earlier, you, you not only can um, do the inference on it, you actually also can run training on it. So you can, um, you, most of the time you will use um, um, pre -trained Model and maybe um, that and there are other AI library exists, um, but I think um, PFJS unique uh, part is that it also support training. Yeah. I think most of other uh, AI library they only um, support uh, inference on the browser or maybe on the Node.js side. Yeah. Mostly uh, those AI uh, library uh, do the training and inference on, uh, in the Python uh, language bindings. If somebody was asking for the link again to the high res video and the slides, that's ibm.biz slash tfj. Can you share? Maybe you can share the. So that's ibm.biz slash tfjs dash node red dash OSS 2020. All right, I'm not sure. I think we have uh, another minute or two if there's any other questions. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. And again, you can find the, the, the Open Source Summit team will be uh, making all this content available so you can get it through them or you can get it through the link that I mentioned earlier, which is ibm.biz slash tfjs dash node red dash OSS 2020. All right, and with that, thank you very much.